We are here in the book of Haggai. Haggai is number 10 out of the 12 minor prophets as we round out the Old Testament. The last 12 books of your Bible known as the minor prophets. These are prophets who were not less important than the other prophets, but just that their writings were generally shorter. Haggai's book here, you'll notice, only two chapters long, so he is one of the minor prophets. His name in Hebrew is uh, spelled with a C-H, it just is that H sound, so it's Haggai. Haggai is his name, it's from the Hebrew word Hag, which means feast or festive. And he prophesies in 520 BC, and we know because he specifically dates his prophecy here for us during the reign of King Darius. He prophesies in 520 BC to the Jewish people, now they're back in Jerusalem, after they've returned from their exile in Babylon. We're going to talk about that and understand it historically so that we can frame it properly. His ministry spanned less than four months. Again, because he dates it so specifically, there are four oracles that he gives us in two chapters. And so his ministry spans from August the 29th until December the 18th, 520 BC. The book of Haggai and the events mentioned here all fit within the book of Ezra. So earlier in your Old Testaments, you have the book of Ezra. Everything about Haggai fits within the book of Ezra. That is key because we're going to use Ezra as a commentary on the book of Haggai as we look together at these two chapters. But what we're going to see from these two chapters is a prophet Haggai who has a passion, he is passionate about seeing his people rise from the ashes of exile and become once again the light to the nations that God has intended. The main theme of this book is Haggai coming to motivate the Jews to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so it'll make more sense as we go through this book together, but let me start here in chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 11 verses from chapter 1 and then five verses from chapter two. So here we go, chapter one of Haggai, verse one. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you, when you brought it, when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine, and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Jump over to chapter 2. In verse 1, in the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came to Hag by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Do not fear. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, it's good to come now together in your house and to open up the words of Haggai here and to see what you would have to say to us today. 
We thank you that you're so gracious with us and patient with us, that you would reveal yourself through the pages of Scripture. And even in this ancient text, we pray that you would bring relevant application to our hearts and lives today. We're grateful for your mercy and your love toward us. Speak to our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. The last three books of the Old Testament, and we're into it now, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three books of the Old Testament are known as post-exilic prophets. What exactly does that mean? Starting with Haggai, and including Zechariah and Malachi, these three books that round out the Old Testament are known as post-exilic. So let me explain what that means. And in order to explain it, I, I'm going to have to give a timeline so everybody understands the chronology of events. When the Jewish people were rebellious against God, when they were worshiping idols instead of the true and living God, when they were rebelling against Him, God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to turn them from their evil ways and turn them back to God. But unfortunately, the people refused to listen to prophet after prophet after prophet. So what God does instead then to get their attention is He brings a foreign army from what today on a map would be Iraq. He brings the Babylonian Empire and He brings them to Jerusalem to besiege Judah, which is the southern kingdom of, of Israel. Now you might ask, why would God bring a foreign nation to come against His own people? Doesn't He love His people more than that? Well, the fact is, because He loves His people, He's, he's going to reach them with another method because they're not responding to the prophets. So he's resorting to bringing a foreign army to get their attention because of their rebellion and their sin and their idolatry. So the year is, I'll just march through this timeline with you, the year is 606 BC. God brings the Babylonians and they besiege Judah, which again is the southern kingdom of Israel, and Jerusalem is the capital city. They come in full force in 606 BC. For the next 20 years, they will besiege Judah. Jerusalem, and the surrounding uh, cities and villages until 586 B.C. when they will capture Jerusalem and they will destroy the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, over the course of those 20 years from 606 B.C. to 586 B.C., the uh, Babylonians deported tens of thousands of Jews from Israel to Babylon, about 900 miles away, in again what is modern Iraq. So over the course of these 20 years, tens of thousands of Jews are being taken captive and deported back to Babylon. They will spend 70 years there. God had already predetermined it to be 70 years, that they are to be on this time out where God's going to get their attention. And two things that He's principally going to deliver them from are idolatry and a monarchy because they worshiped idols, and He would purge them of idolatry, and when they would come back to Israel, they would no longer worship idols. And He also purged them of a monarchy. Now, it's a modern method of government, I understand, but among God's people, He wanted to be their king, and they didn't want God to be king, and so they adopted kings of the foreign nations around them so that they would not be under a theocracy, and God allowed them to have kings, but it wasn't His best intention. This was their deliberate way of trying to get out from God being their king. When they come back, they will no longer be a monarchy. In fact, even today, the form of government that Israel has is not a monarchy. And so, God is going to purge them of a few things over those 70 years. But then God is going to move on the heart of a new king, King Cyrus of Persia. The Persians and the Medes overthrow the Babylonian Empire, and in 538 BC, King Cyrus of Persia allows the Jews to return to their homeland and to rebuild the temple. It really is the move of God on this pagan king's heart. He allows the Jewish people, they have favor with Him. He lets them go back to Israel, and they start to rebuild their lives and their city and the temple of God. And in 536 B.C., they lay the foundation for the temple. Why? Because it was destroyed in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians first came. So 536 B.C., when they get back in the homeland, they lay the foundation of the temple of God, and thus, 70 years between 606 B.C. and 536 is their completed sentence. For 70 years they had been sentenced, and now God allows them to go back to their homeland, they're on probation, 
and Haggai is their parole officer. Does everybody understand what's happening now? So they've been let out of jail. They get to go home, uh, but they're still on probation, and Haggai comes as the parole officer, and Haggai will come in the year 520 B.C., 16 years after they laid the foundation stones of the temple. Now, consider this. As soon as they lay the foundation of the temple in 536 B.C., they abruptly stop building the temple. They just suddenly stop the building project, and the building project lies dormant for 16 years until Haggai shows up in 520. And Haggai is going to challenge them and encourage them to build. For 16 years, without the temple of God, there's been no worship of God. There's been no temple sacrifices. There's been no spiritual life because there's been no temple. And all those things revolved around the temple. And so when Haggai first comes to them, brought to them by God in 520 BC, he challenges them. Look back in your Bibles here at Haggai chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And Haggai says in verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your parceled, rather in your paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Is Is this right for you to be in your nice paneled houses while the temple of God is still in ruins? You haven't been building that for 16 years. What's the deal here? And we actually find out from the book of Ezra that the paneling that they used for the interior of their homes was imported from Lebanon, and it was originally intended to be used to panel the interior of God's house. And instead of using it to panel the interior of God's house, they had confiscated it for the use in their own homes. And so Haggai comes to them, and in the words of Dwight Schrute, he's like, what are you doing? What's going on here? What, what are you doing? This, what, you have taken the paneling intended for God's house. You're paneling your own houses, and you're busy building your own homes and establishing your livelihoods. All the while, God's house remains in ruins. What is going on here? And so he challenges them. And Haggai actually connects, if you noticed with me when we were reading through chapter 1, he connects their lack of honoring God with their material lack. In chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, that's what he means when he says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. You ever felt like that, that as soon as you make your, you know, your, your income for your job, it just is like, it, it's, get, it's, it's put in, a, in, in some kind of a bag with holes in it, it just goes right through. Like, I just made this and now it seems to be suddenly gone. Like, like on a trip to Costco, you know how that feels? <laughs> you ever gone into Costco just for eggs and milk and you came out with a thousand dollars worth of stuff? You think, what, what just happened here? I just wanted eggs and milk. Anyway, What Haggai's actually saying to them is there's a correlation. When you deny God the resources he's given you, you will suddenly find your own resources lacking. You know, it is amazing that when when we offer the little we have to God, how he does much compared to what we think we can do when we hold on to a lot. And so Haggai ties this together. He says, do you see how just you are impacted materially because you are denying God his his rightful due and his rightful honor? And then in addition, at the end of chapter 1, God says, and and it says that he brings a drought upon the land. Why? Because God's trying to use all these things to get their attention. You're back in the land, God's saying to them, I brought you back in the land. You're here by my hand, by my mercy, and yet you're not giving me the priority that, that I deserve. And so thus, there are things lacking in your own life because I'm trying to get your attention in that regard. Now, there are a couple of different angles that you can take in approaching the study of the book of Haggai. One of the angles that I've typically taken over the years whenever I've taught through the book of Haggai is the whole idea of misplaced priorities. And that clearly is um, a lesson to be drawn out of the book of Haggai. Uh, The people had misplaced their priorities. Um, For 16 years, the temple of God had been still lying in ruins while they went about their own 
business, building their own homes, building their own livelihoods, having family and career and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and they had misplaced their priority. There's clearly an element of that in this story where they had not really given God his rightful place in their lives and his rightful due. But there's another angle to this story. And quite honestly, I've, I've never taken this angle before, but I was challenged in, in my prep time for this story. And in some ways, I feel that perhaps when I get to heaven, I may have to apologize to some of the people in this story, because over the years, I've really hammered the whole idea of they misplaced priorities. They didn't make God first. They went about their own lives doing what they jolly well wanted to do. All the while, God's house remained in ruins. Those people just didn't understand priorities. And I, I would use it it, not in a self-serving way, in a way to apply it to all of us, because that'll preach in Loudoun County. And the idea that sometimes we can get so busy with our own lives and so caught up in our livelihoods and our careers and our ambitions and all this kind of stuff that we don't make God priority and, and we don't focus on the work of the Lord and, and the kingdom of God and all that kind of stuff, that will preach. And I understand that. And I have preached that. But I think in some ways, I may have to apologize to some people in this story one day because, quite honestly, and here's the other angle that we can take, and this is the approach I'm going to take in, in the study here of Haggai. Okay, they stopped building suddenly and abruptly, and for 16 years, the temple of God went without being rebuilt. But I, I think we should stop and ask, and here's the angle we're going to take, why? Why? Why did they stop building? You know, for years I would just hammer the principle home, misplaced priorities, misplaced priorities. And I never stopped and really asked, why? Why did they stop building? Was it purely for selfish reasons? Did they get lazy and give up? Is it as simple as lacking right priorities? We need to dig a little deeper here and ask, why? Now, let me illustrate this and tell you why it's important for us to do this. I, I heard about this, and I don't know if this is a, a true story or just, you know, something I, I heard it as an illustration, but I share it with you as an illustration either way. I heard this story about a man who was a widow, and he was living alone, and he would often sit out on the front porch of his house, and people in the neighborhood would walk by and always wave and give him a smile and have a little conversation with him. But then... The neighbors, as they would walk by, began to notice that the old man hadn't cut his lawn in a while, and now his lawn was overgrown and weeds everywhere, and so HOA got involved and sent him a violation, like, you, you don't have your lawn manicured, and you're making the rest of the neighborhood look bad, and you need to get out there and mow your lawn, and, and then people began to notice that his mailbox was overflowing, and a bunch of newspapers were delivered on his driveway that he had never gathered, and so he got more HOA violation notices about that stuff, like get the newspapers off your driveway and, you know, mow your lawn and all this kind of stuff. But nobody stopped to ask why, until one day somebody finally decided, we need to call the police. The police came, broke into his house, and found that he had been dead for a few weeks. And see, nobody offered to find out why was his lawn overgrown. They were just bothered by it. And nobody asked why was mail overflowing from his mailbox and newspapers lying on his driveway. They were just bothered that they were. I think it's easy for us to read the book of Haggai and just get bothered at their misplaced priorities and think to ourselves, okay, we need to get our priorities right. It's easy just to look at this and to get bothered. That, that they had misplaced their priorities, that they had put God on hold while they attended to their own busy lives. But I think what we need to do is to stop and ask why. Why did they suddenly stop building? What might be going on under the surface that we don't know about? Before we judge them for being lazy and unmotivated with misplaced priorities, Let's dig a little deeper here, deeper here and find out why. Now, fortunately for us, we have a commentary on the book of Haggai, because as I mentioned, the book of Haggai and all the events of Haggai fit within the book of Ezra. And Ezra gives us the backstory. 
Ezra tells us why they stopped building. Ezra tells us why for 16 years the house of God would remain in ruins. I'm going to read a little bit from Ezra. You don't need to turn there or you can if you want. I'm going to read from Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 so we can get the perspective here and the backstory on why they stopped building. So in Ezra chapter 4, this is what it says in verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Azaradon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says these are adversaries of the Jewish people. They're claiming while the Jews were in captivity, to have been there in the land offering sacrifices to God. Hold on a second. There's no temple. How are you offering sacrifices to God? Listen, this is just their way of trying to infiltrate the ranks here. These are adversaries of the Jewish people. So Zerubbabel, who's the governor during this particular time, he's on to them. And he says there in Ezra 4 verse 3, but Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us, to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And then it says the people of the land, the adversaries, tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This went on for years. They, they were just continually harassing and discouraging and frustrating the Jewish people in their attempt to build the house of God. Furthermore, it says in the rest of the book of Ezra that in addition to discouraging them and frustrating them, did you hear what I just said? That they hired counselors. They hired counselors. What does that mean? It means they hired attorneys. They hired attorneys. That's what the Bible is saying. You know how today, with respect to a lawyer in a courtroom, we call him a counselor. They hired attorneys to issue a legal injunction to prevent the Jews from building the temple of God. By the way, when I was reading through this, I'm like, oh yeah, kind of, it's kind of a familiar story for us. I mean, for those of you who don't know, when we went to build this building, we were sued by an adjoining landowner. The town Council of Leesburg and the mayor signed off on it, but we got sued. It ended up in court. We lost in circuit court. Fortunately, the Virginia Supreme Court heard our case and gave us a unanimous decision in our favor. But I'm reading this and I'm going, yeah, it still goes on today. Still goes on today. So they hired attorneys and they wrote a letter to a new king on the throne of Persia. Now his name is Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes was not all that familiar with what Cyrus had said in letting the Jews go back and build the temple. When Artaxerxes gets this letter from the attorneys, he reads it and he's like, yeah, this is not a good thing because these Jewish people have a reputation of rebelling against kings and they're not going to do that under my watch, sends a letter back to the adversaries and, and says to them, you march up to Jerusalem and you demand that they stop building and Artaxerxes issues this cease and desist order. And so those guys go marching up to Jerusalem. It says this in Ezra 4, 23 to 24. Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus, the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. What happened in the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia? The Bible says Haggai was sent by God to encourage the people to start to rebuild. So this is where Haggai then enters. And he encourages them with the words that we read at the beginning of our study. Glance back in your Bibles at chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Haggai shows up and he says to them, yet now be strong, this is chapter 2 verse 4, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came up out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. All right, your attention. 
Now put all this together. We have Ezra as the commentary on the events of the book of Haggai. So when we look at why they stopped building in 536 BC, and suddenly, abruptly, they just stopped the building process, it's not because they were lazy. It was not because they were unmotivated. It was not because they were indifferent. It was because they were discouraged. The adversaries of the Jews had frustrated them, had threatened them, had gotten the government involved to issue a cease and desist order, had themselves, these adversaries, even marched up to Jerusalem armed with weapons to tell these people, stop. And so they got discouraged. And the Jewish people retreated. And the house of God went without being rebuilt for 16 years until Haggai shows up and he encourages them. Now we know the why. Why did they stop building? They, they were discouraged, so they gave up. You know, when you get super discouraged about something, um, is it helpful to you when in your discouragement someone comes to you with both barrels loaded and chews you out? Or... Is it helpful to you when somebody comes alongside of you and says, God's got this, be strong, don't fear, God is with you. This is what Haggai does. He shows up here. He's not berating them. He's, he's, he's not um, angry. He encourages them. Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, you remnant of Israel. God is with you. Do not be afraid. And he comes alongside of them, and he encourages them in this way. And at the end of chapter 1, the Bible says that God began to stir the spirit of Zerubbabel. He began to stir the spirit of Joshua. And he began to stir the spirit of the remnant of the people there. And they began to work on the house of the Lord, coupled with Haggai's encouraging words to motivate them. And they actually started to do the work of God's temple again. And what's interesting, you know what's interesting about the book of Haggai, different from all the other prophets? That the people actually did what the prophet told them to do. You read almost any of the other prophets in the Old Testament, and the people are like, no, we don't like what you have to say. In fact, we're going to kill you. That's usually what they, way they responded. In this story, they're like, yes, thank you for that word of encouragement. Thank you. We got discouraged. We were frustrated in the way that they were coming against us. Thank you. Yes, in the name of the Lord, we can do this. And they marched right back up to Jerusalem, and they rebuilt the temple of God in five years. From 520 B.C., when Haggai started to challenge them, they finished it in 515 B.C., and the temple of God was completely rebuilt. All they needed was a little encouragement. All they needed was a little encouragement. Until you know somebody's story, don't judge by what you see on the surface. Yes, the book of Haggai is about putting God first over our own interests. But it is also a book that reminds us that there are sometimes reasons why people do what they do, why people behave as they behave. It may not necessarily be an excuse for their behavior. It wasn't an excuse here. God challenged the people. You need to get back to the work of God. But even though somebody's behavior may not be an excuse, it might be a reason for us to get a little bit deeper and to understand their story. Because if we get a little bit deeper and understand someone's story, Maybe we will have compassion for them instead of judgment, and maybe we will have some comfort for them instead of frustration. God sent Haggai to a people who needed to be encouraged, and it's easy for us just to look at this book and say, oh, these people, 16 years, uh, they, they didn't do God's work and misplaced priorities and their busy lives, and the fact of the matter is that if you, if you lift up the hood and you look under the hood a little bit, what, what's going on in their hearts is that these people are just weighed down. They are discouraged. That's why they're doing what they're doing. So again, why people do what they do may not be an excuse for their behavior, but it might be a reason for ours. How are we to behave and respond to somebody based on what? Just the surface appearance of things? Or perhaps we should dig a little deeper to understand what's going on 
in their lives. You know, when a baby is hungry and a baby is wet, uh, we don't get angry at them when they cry. We realize that there are some underlying issues here. Oh, they're probably hungry. Oh, they're probably wet. So what do we do? We feed them, we change them, and we comfort them. But suddenly then, when people become adults, we stop discerning what might be under the surface. We stop looking at, well, what might be the issue that's underneath why they behave the way they behave. And we lack some empathy and compassion and sympathy towards people because we just look at the surface and we evaluate what we see on the surface without having any consideration about what might be going on underneath. It's important for us to realize this. Your coworker might be nasty for a reason. Your neighbor might be belligerent for a reason. Your extended family member uh, might be angry for a reason. Maybe they, somebody betrayed them. Maybe a spouse betrayed them. Maybe, maybe they've gone through a tragedy. Maybe a child has died. Or maybe they got bad news on a diagnosis. You never know. You never know why people are behaving the way they're behaving. Don't just simply look at the surface and think to yourself, well, that's not right, and, and, and they shouldn't be like that. Okay, maybe they shouldn't. But maybe we should dig a little bit deeper to understand how we might possibly be a Haggai in their life, to come alongside of them and say, God's got this. Don't be afraid. Be strong. The Lord is with you. And that's what Haggai did in this story. We've got to dig a little deeper under the surface to realize maybe there's something there that is valued in the life of this person worth ministering to. I share this illustration. I, I shared this many years ago. This, this will be something that some of you have heard before, but every time I think about this kind of a theme, this story from my own life comes, comes to the surface for me. It's not a, a story I'm proud of. But years ago, when I was about 19 or 20, somewhere in there, I hadn't been a believer very long. Um, I was attending a church where uh, in, in the middle of the church service, uh, they do what, what we typically do here between the worship time and the teaching time. There's a moment of meet and greet. Everybody stands up and they, and they, they greet each other. Um, I know some of you don't like that. I get emails once in a while. It's flu season. Don't make me shake somebody's hand. I might get coronavirus. Just stop drinking corona and you'll be fine. But any... <laughs> And so, so I know some people like a little germaphobe about that kind of thing, but, but this is the kind of thing that it happens, right? And, um, and so it was happening in this church where I was. Now, there was a particular lady in this church in her early 60s that um, just by her appearance just bothered me, and, and I'll explain. So she, um, again, like 60-ish, and she would always come into church late with her husband, and uh, she was always dressed to the T's. I mean, she, high permed hair, um, thick, thick uh, makeup. It was the envy of an undertaker. I mean, it was just uh, all over and, and smeared on a dress two sizes too small that she would always squeeze into and jewelry everywhere. I'm not exaggerating. She had a ring on every finger. She had 10 rings. And she had, well, we just have a lot of gold necklace jewelry hanging down. And she'd always wear this cornucopia, this gold cornucopia around her neck. I'm not making it up. You know, cornucopia, like what you put on a Thanksgiving table with gourds on the inside. She had one of those hanging around her neck, walking in late to church. And I would always think, what's her deal? And, and doesn't anybody want to tell her how unbecoming she looks all like that, Right? So in my judgmental heart, I was 19 or 20. Don't judge me now, all right? I've come a long way. Still got a long way to go, but I've come a long way. And, and, I, and I'm just thinking, what, what in the world? Meet and greet time happens. And of all the days, she had to come in late and sit in the row right in front of me. That's what she did. So now it's meet and greet time. Great. She stands up to turn around and to shake my hand. And when she stretches out her hand to shake my hand, it was a warm summer day, so she had on a short sleeve dress. I noticed on her forearm, numbers were tattooed. This is a picture, a similar picture, not hers. This is a man with tattooed numbers on his arm because he was a survivor of a Nazi concentration camp. This was typically done in Auschwitz. 
the, the Nazis would sew ID numbers on their clothing until that got too laborious, and so they just started tattooing numbers on prisoners as they would come through the concentration camp. And little did I know, that was her story. And in this 25-second meet and greet, it's as if she looked with penetrating eyes right into my soul and knew exactly the judgment I had in my heart towards her, based solely on the surface, on appearance. And this is what she said to me. She said, hi, my name is, and I don't remember her name. Hi, my name is, how are you? Listen, you're gonna have to forgive me. She says to me, I know I just kinda get dressed up over the top. But she said, when I was a teenager, I spent some time in Auschwitz. And I vowed if I ever made it out of there alive, I would never be in rags again. I couldn't tell you what the sermon was that day. It still bothers me when I retell this story. See, because I, I just looked at the surface. She taught me a valuable lesson that day. Don't make an evaluation on the surface. You never know what's going on in somebody's heart and in somebody's life. Shallow surface people are a dime a dozen in our world. How about as Christ followers, we actually go deeper with somebody to love their heart, to value their soul that Jesus died for. It's important that we get to know somebody beyond just the surface. That we accept and love an individual with all their flaws and all their scars because we've got some of our own too. Somebody once said that Christianity is one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Well, let's help people find the bread of life. Let's direct people to Jesus. And one of the principal ways that people are going to want Jesus is when we genuinely, authentically love them enough to ask their story. They may not want to share their story. Or you may not have an opportunity to ask what their story is. But at the very least, give them the benefit of the doubt and think the best of them. And ask yourselves, how would Jesus approach them, love them, and interact with them? Be that Haggai to somebody who comes alongside and basically says, God's got this. Be strong. Don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. And serve to be somebody who knows the backstory a little bit, at least enough to have compassion and grace and love for those who need it. I end with this verse I'll put on the screen for us. 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you, Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we thank you for the book of Haggai. And even though, yes, it is a book of priorities, may it be a book that reminds us there's a reason why they stopped building. They got discouraged. They got frustrated. And all they needed was somebody to come along with a little word of encouragement. But if we don't know the backstory, then it's, it's easy for us just, just to judge them and to think that they're lazy. Forgive us, Lord, whenever we've looked at people and judged them on the surface. Maybe there's a reason underneath all that, why they are the way they are or why they act the way they act. And we need to be people like Haggai who come alongside of them and instead of just judging, genuinely care enough to encourage. Maybe we need to be Haggai to somebody today. Just somebody who instead of evaluating stuff on the surface just comes along and says, tell me your story. I just wanna minister God's encouragement to you today. Use us Lord as vessels but help us to search our own judgmental hearts first so that we might be used by you to your fullest. Glorify yourself through us, Lord. 
Help us to be humble and tender-hearted towards one another, gracious and compassionate. In the same way you've been toward us, may we be toward others. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you all.